So I'm Shiro Armstrong here at the ANU. I'm co-director of the AJRC with Ipe Fujiwara, who you met earlier on. Um, we're moving now into the politics session, political risks in Japan. Um, we had the economics and civil society in the morning. Uh, and as Warwick McGibbon put it in the economics session, um, the economists have it right, the theory's right. Um, success depends on the politics and political leadership. Um, and J Japanese politics is always exciting, um, but I think particularly exciting now um, for different reasons than, than usual, um, perhaps over the past half dozen years. Um, Prime Minister Abe has been in power for almost two years now. Um, we haven't had such a strong leader since Prime Minister Koizumi uh, much earlier on, um, and he's been able to affect some big changes in Japanese society and in the economy um, so far, um, but also in foreign policy. Um, it's been a recent cabinet reshuffle. Uh, our foreign policy is becoming quite active, um, but we have icy relations with South Korea and China um, amongst a whole host of um, um, other issues. And so we have a panel of three people to talk through many of these issues. Um, the first is Professor Nobumasa Akiyama, um, who's professor of at the Graduate School of Law and the School of International and Public Policy at Hitotsubashi University. Uh, his research focuses on the role of nuclear weapons uh, in Northeast Asia, uh, and is also on the Funabashi Commission for investigating the Daiichi nuclear accident. So, Professor Akiyama, I'll get you to talk for 10, 15 minutes. Thank you very much, Cheryl. Um, I'm all, uh, pretty much honored to be here at ANU, and uh, uh, also, I'm very much fortunate to be in Australia in particular because uh, actually my hobby is uh, stargazing. And, uh, uh, you know, the, I arrived a day earlier and uh, I should spend the night uh, close to the uh, facility of uh, uh, the suburb of uh, 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 the Canberra and took uh, some photos of, uh, you know, Southern Pole and other stars. So if you are interested in uh, uh, the, the star, uh, pictures of stars rather than my talk, please come, uh, you know, access to my Facebook. <laughs> um, and uh, I have to actually apologize that uh, my expertise is not on Japanese domestic politics, but uh, more about uh, nuclear non-proliferation, Japan's uh, policy, security policy. But, um, but somewhat, uh, you know, I was, lucky to think about how you know, our politics goes. And uh, so let me uh, uh, start my presentation by uh, sort of saying, rephrasing the, uh, the title of this uh, the, uh, panel. Right? Uh, I'm, I'm not going to talk about uh, risks, but more about the challenges. I think that is more sort of proper characterization that I'm going to talk. So, uh, well, how do we characterize the Abe cabinet 2.0? I think 1.0 was rather disastrous, unfortunately for him. Uh, but uh, he, Mr. Abe, made a pretty much a constraint. He didn't go to Yaskuni, and he tried to be more mild. But this time, he went to Yaskuni, and he did not really hide sort of sense of nationalist uh, sentiment. But still, you know, he is pretty much successful so far, in my in my view. So uh, one of the characteristics is that he, his cabinet is pretty robust. Um, you know, it, it survived the major political challenges. So increase the consumption tax and the changes of interpretation of the constitution with regard to the collective self-defense and uh, introduced the Secret Information uh, Protection Act. Then, uh, you know, he hadn't had a dialogue with the leaders of uh, China and the ROK so actually each of them could kill the, uh, the cabinet. And you know, remember when the Mr. Takeshita was the prime minister and introduced the consumption tax, he sacrificed his cabinet for the introduction of the consumption tax. And Mr. Hashimoto, he was at that time very popular, but because he raised the consumption tax by 2%, and he, his approval, approval rate dropped sharply. But he, uh, Mr. Abe survived with a uh, consumption tax. And uh, the co this uh, collective self-defense issue has been sort of uh, seen as a taboo for the politicians and in, even for the conservatives. But uh, you know, he did it. So it's amazing you know, his cabinet was so robust. 
then、uh, somebody said he could be lucky. You know, for example, he said Japan is back and the US Japan relations is back. But this groundwork has already been done by Mr. Noda, his predecessor from DPJ. So、uh, me, many actually US policymakers said, you know, the US Japan relations had already been back when Mr. Abe was back.、Uh, and also, the economy was almost ready to recover. Uh, you know, and in previous sessions, uh, you know, uh, Professor Watanabe talked about sort of a clear trend after Abenomics was introduced, there is a poor trend. But I think、uh, some people said that groundwork also has already been done before, and the, the economy was ready for the recovery at that time. Then,、uh, uh, you know, despite of、uh, the challenges that Mr. Abe actually posed to the international community with regard to history issues, The、China made a sort of some strategic own goals. The China made some proactive actions in South China Sea and East China Sea, and that raises some concerns. And nowadays,、uh, actually, South Korea also made some、uh, concerns about the freedom of speech or freedom of media by sort of、uh, keeping one of journalists, Japanese journalists in Korea for the reasons that he, made, uh, he wrote a、uh, uh, sort of op ed. Which kind of teasing uh, prim, uh, the, the President Park. Then DPJ had performed so badly that the Japanese people learned patience with the LDP. Then、uh, nobody in LDP tried, tried to challenge Mr. Abe. So it seems to me that he's been pretty much in a lucky environment. And they supported the Mr. Abe's politics that can decide. But it's also true that Japan,、uh, Mr. Abe has communicate,、uh, sort of communicated with、uh, the nations with a, po a positive message. The people actually try to trust what he said about Japan's back, and、uh, so a better mix would be put the Japanese economy back. So, then, question probably、uh, which is the interest of most of you is Mr. Abe a nationalist or pragmatist? You know, there are some elements. Of nationalists. He said, Nihon wo tori modosu. Japan should be back, Japan,、uh, reclaiming Japan,、uh, bring back Japan. I don't know from, where, from whom he tried to bring back, back Japan. <laughs>、um, then, uh, you know,、uh, the Professor Samuel has mentioned,、uh, Senmo regime kara da kyaku, so get out of、uh, the post war regime.、Um, it's obviously to me a sort of a Revisionist view, and、uh, I'm just concerned whether he is trying to deny the post war international setting where, in which Japan enjoyed a sort of a prosperity and recovery from the, the Second World War, or he has no clear understanding on what it implies in terms of history or not. But anyway, these are somewhat appealing to the nationalist elements of the Japanese society. And then、uh, he went to Yasukuni Shrine. Uh, on, the, on the Christmas Day in the United States. So, my friends in US, Depart US State Department so much furious that he, their Christmas dinner was interrupted. With,、uh, <laughs> and he, they were running around and making phone calls with the colleagues and t r y e d to do something. But anyway, other than that, that was a kind of surprise to the many of the、uh, people, including myself. Before、uh, he, Mr. Abe visited Yaskuni, I was telling my friends in the United States, why don't we judge Mr. Abe with what he does, not but what he did and what he said? Then, actually, what he did was to visit the Askin Shrine. <laughs> <laughs> so,、uh, you know, I kind of lost the face. <laughs> but what I mean, what, I mean we should judge what, with what he does is not about the sort of these history things, but policies. So, he has more sort of pragmatic、uh, and policy decisions. Uh, so, although he once suggested、uh, to revise or amend k o n o statement or、uh, Murayama statement with regard to the history, but he made it clear that there will be no amendment of k o n o and Murayama statements. Although recently his friends are suggesting that overwrite these statements with a new statement next year. I don't know what happens next year, but、uh, I think that. He, he, I think he, Mr. Abe would be very much cautious about the, you know, make a calculation of what implies to the, the sort of、uh, Japan's relations with neighboring countries as well as the United States. 
and then he showed strong commitment to the U.S.-Japan alliance. If he is a true nationalist, it's, you know, he might seek a sort of more independent, uh, you know, the kind of goalist uh, policy in security. But you know, his decision is to get along with the U.S.-Japan alliance and strengthen Japan's role in the alliance. So that is maybe different from a sort of a nationalist view on him. And thirdly, uh, so seeking partnership with Australia, India, Russia, and other countries. And that is also more uh, kind of representation of his aspect of internationalist. And promoting TPP, despite of this strong opposition from uh, domestic traditional constituencies of LDP. So the second question, is Japan back? Uh, Abenomics. We had an excellent uh, a panel in the morning, and uh, since I'm not an economist, uh, I don't think I have anything to add. But from an uh, ordinary citizen's viewpoint, psychology is pretty much important. And uh, you know, our psychology is judged by the statistic numbers, stock price. I don't know, stock price isn't everything, but when uh, the uh, diet was dissolved, the price was 9,024 yen at uh, the Nikkei index. Then it became uh, 16,374 yen uh, in uh, actually last month. Then now it dropped because of some recession or sort of anxiety in the um, world economy. But you know, this it seems to me that there is a pretty much strong confidence among the Japanese people that the Abenomics may be working. And although GDP statistics, it's a bit ambiguous. Then uh, uh, challenges still ahead, though. Uh, maybe growth could be slowed down. And uh, econo uh, economists in the UK uh, wrote kind of a small piece on the Ab Abegedon. Well, it's a kind of Armageddon of, uh, version of Abenomics. <laughs> Uh, so there may be a clash if uh, the other uh, sort of amount of JGP uh, get sort of going up. And then uh, the uncertainty is if uh, the Jap Japanese government, government further raises the ta consumption tax by 2%, then what happens? What about foreign security policy? Uh, I think I would like to characterize his vision of uh, uh, the foreign policy is uh, bringing geopolitics back in. He tried to, so his uh, foreign policy is characterized as a bird's eye view of world affairs. Uh, so look down the earth and uh, have a sort of wide, very broad perspective, just simply focusing on US Japan Alliance or Asia, but more as a global perspective. Uh, because one partly driven by the energy security, after Fukushima, the uh, no uh, nuclear power plants working at this moment, so more necessity to secure the uh, energy supply. So he uh, naturally, government has to take care of its policy toward the Middle East and the more stable uh, energy supply. Secondly, uh, I don't know if he's driven by his own interest or a more strategic perspective, but he has a strong kind of a, a proximity, sense of proximity probably with the uh, leaders of India, Russia, and Turkey. Uh, with Mr. Putin, he met several times, I think more than he met with uh, the, uh, President Obama, and uh, in India as well, and Turkey. So, you know, the leaders of these countries are relatively uh, strong with a strong nature. So, I don't know, he has a kind of a sort of a similarity, he may find some similarities with himself, but uh, anyway, this uh, rather untraditional way of conducting foreign policy was his maybe characteristic of his policy. And Baza, uh, you know, diplomacy, Amazingly, he had already paid more than 50 times to foreign uh, countries, which is even much more than Mr. Koizumi did in la his fa five years. And also, he chose Africa as the, the destination for the, his first uh, trip uh, in 2014. So he probably has some strategic mind to engage with the world more. And strength in security partnership, you know, US-Japan alliance, we, we are, uh, the, our governments are currently conducting the uh, upgrading the, uh, the guidelines for the defen uh, defense guidelines. And I think that's a pretty much positive uh, 
sort of direction. And also, you know, he, it seems he is completing the security diamond, which is in a sort of concept he published before he became prime minister. And at that time, it was some, some sort of criticized as it may be something to encircle China or kind of, uh, but that is the diamonds consisting of four peaks, Japan, Guam, India, and Australia. And if that ties are completed, I think the, uh, the security of Indo-Pacific region, India-Pacific region, could be further sort of strengthened. So I think it's a good move. But although I have a small footnote about India, may people in Japan find that the relations with India with, with a positive uh, way. But uh, you know, I remember one US prominent strategist said, everybody falls in love with India, but India never falls in love in with anybody. So we have to be careful about very pragmatic move of India. But with this, uh, if uh, that diamond, uh, diamond completed, the, that would be a uh, pretty much positive for the stability of the region. But missing piece is China and ROK. You know, Mr. Obama once tried to mediate between our two close allies of the United States at the margin of a, a nuclear security summit in this uh, the spring. But what happens? You know? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, it's for a part, unfortunately. <laughs> so, uh, but you know, from a person, those who are work, actually working on security issues, they're engaging as sort of uh, if uh, Japan and ROK are working together, that will be much benefit for uh, security of a East Asia along with the United States. So, uh, you know, I hope that uh, that won't you know come back to like this way. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, finally. What would be the challenge then? I, that's the main t thing that I have to conclude. I will con conclude with this. Um, the, my question is, can Mr. Abe meet the expectations, various expectations at home abroad, as well as abroad? Uh, on the foreign policy, um, I think Japan, Japanese government need to deliver what they have promised with the international community. Uh, you know, Mr. Abe, made a very good speech at the UN on the commitment to the, the, sort of, uh, the rights of women and also the uh, issues of Africa, the stability of the Middle East, and various things. So maybe he need to, uh, Japan need to deliver these commitments. And uh, probably there is an expectation on the US side. Maybe Japan could do more with regard to the, the stability of safety in the Middle, Middle East, possibly uh, after the collective self-defense uh, amendment is made. But I think uh, the, the Professor Samuels men mentioned that Japan had already been doing something which is beyond the, the conventional interpretation of uh, collective self-defense, even before the amendment of the interpretation is made. So in my view, I don't think there is not much that Japan can do newly, but still, uh, there is a kind of a politics, there should be politics going on. And in particular, uh, the, uh, the, the situation in the Middle East is very, very difficult at this moment. So if J Japanese government would like to do something in the Middle East, I think that trigger a big discourse uh, at domestic uh, uh, you know, uh, arena. And then uh, restoring the relationship with China and ROK. I'm curious, actually, why uh, Mr. Abe has not been act so proactively to restore the relationship so far. I wonder he had a calculation that naturally or eventually the two countries must approach Japan for, the, for restoring the relationship. I don't know, but uh, so far, I think his calculation was right. In uh, China, ROK are uh, also ready for the sort of, uh, sort of kind of rapprochement. And although it's not so sure whether you know we can see the you know, 100% restoration of the relationship back on uh, the relationship, normalcy is back on track. Then, uh, but then my worry on this foreign policy front is, I would characterize this as a strategic insolvency. Japan has made so many commitments, promises made. Then, do we have resources available to fill 
this commitment. Um, maybe there is a political will, but some uh, fiscal constraints and uh, constraints in a domestic discourse, uh, bound by the domestic discourse, I'm, not, I, I'm a bit uh, skeptical. Although I think uh, you know, generally the message has a very important positive political Im uh, impact. So at, you know, message itself is very good, but then how he can deliver these uh, uh, commitments with uh, limited resources, that is a challenge that he has to face in, in, front, in, in the foreign policy front. Uh, what about domestic politics? Um, you know, for, for ordinary citizens, inter I'm interested to know who will be the, the, the contender to Mr. Abe, or who will be the successor. I don't see anybody at this moment. You know, Ishiba, Mr. Ishiba was trying to be one, but he finally ended up as a member of the cabinet, and he is not so, uh, at this moment, successful to be recognized as a successor, po possible successor of uh, Mr. Abe. Otherwise, I don't see anything. And the DPJ and other opposition too weak. And uh, I'm, uh, I, you know, I would like to see more robust and strong opposition for more healthy policy dialogue. And secondly, there may be potential social divide uh, over foreign security policy, including history issues. That is the second one. Thirdly, there are some local elections uh, scheduled this fall uh, in Okinawa and uh, Fukushima, and uh, I would like to see the impact of these uh, local elections. I think uh, LDP, uh, uh, LDP candidate may be defeated at Okinawa, and in particular Okinawa, base relocation issue has been so much outstanding uh, question, and uh, it could even divide Okinawa and, and Tokyo further. So, uh, you know, how he could handle this is uh, another challenge. And finally, foremost, um, um, most important thing is can uh, Mr. Abe sustain the economic growth, the trend of growth of the economy? Uh, so we have discussed the, what was the third arrow really for the growth strategy, and uh, is current fiscal monetary policy sustainable? And the previous session suggested that maybe it's, uh, we have to be cautious about it. But, uh, that's what the Mr. Abe has to overcome, and that will be maybe risk for the Japanese politics as well as society. So thank you very much. Uh, next we have Professor Richard Samuels, uh, who needs no further introduction since the uh, keynote he gave just a little bit earlier, and I believe he's speaking on how Japan responded to the 311 catastrophe. Please welcome Richard Samuels again. Uh, thanks very much. You know, I, I appreciate the chance to revisit uh, 311, but we'll, uh, we'll try to be quite brief since, A, I've already tipped my analytic hand to you, and uh, second, you may have already had enough of 311 uh, by now. Um, having said that, let me talk to you a little bit about 311. Uh, 311 uh, was a crisis, and, and uh, crises are, uh, are usually depicted as a great many different different things. One here's uh, Opportunity a lot, but but it's it, there's much more about much more that's embedded in the way we think and talk about crises. One thing, though, that I that I discovered to my surprise uh, that we don't associate much uh, with uh, with crises is to think about it as an instrument, to think about it as a tool. Um, as I say, I tip my analytic hand. It's the way of using history, and I'm not going to quote Machiavelli again. Um, but I'm going to quote instead another great. Uh, do we have um, Do we have this teed up? I want to, I want to quote a, another great political philosopher. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. All right. So I'm going to uh, quote another great political philosopher, uh, Rahm Emanuel, <laughs> uh, who said that uh, we should never waste a good crisis. Now that's what I'm talking about. All right. That's what I'm talking about here. Um, and I think understanding how a crisis is used by political entrepreneurs re requires us to listen to a national conversation. What are people talking about? So it, sound, it seemed to me, as I, was, as I was doing this book, that there were really four things um, that the Japanese were talking about um, after uh, the catastrophe. Uh, the first was uh, leadership, the quality of Japanese leadership. Um, 
The second was risk. The third uh, was solidarity and community, which we, we've already heard a bit about uh, this morning. And, and the last was change. So let me, let me just flick at the first three, spend a little bit more time on the, on the fourth, and then get out of your way. On leadership, um, you know, Prime Minister Khan, uh, as I said in my remarks earlier, became the villain in chief. He was, he was the bad guy by all accounts. He, he bungled it, he didn't do well, and so, and so on. I, we've, heard all, we've heard all that without regard for, I'm not making a judgment whether that's correct or not, but it, what's interesting is that it didn't matter at all if the critiques of Prime Minister Khan's performance were inconsistent. People said that he was, he was too close to the, to the case. People said he was too distant. People said he acted too quickly. People said he acted too slowly. People said that he was too involved. Others said he was too insouciant. It, it just, it, he couldn't buy a vowel. That's an Americanism that I don't know if it works in Australia. But anyway, um, the point is that leadership was up for grabs. Everyone talked about the, the idea that um, Japanese leadership is an oxymoron and, uh, and bemoaned it. Uh, the second is, is, is that, so that's, uh, that's uh, Prime Minister Khan and uh, his partner, uh, Edano uh, Yukio, sort of partly, um, uh, partly shaded, shielded there. Um, on risk, um, this is a very hoary trope in, um, in Japanese political discourse. It's captured in the small island trading nation, the Shimaguniron uh, idea. So it's no surprise, and shouldn't be a surprise to anyone, that it became an important element in the national conversation after 311, because the anticipation of further danger was everywhere. That's what people, I mean, not surprisingly, were concerned about. Six months, that is on September 11th, 2011, when I was in Tokyo doing the research for this book, I just did a quick Google on Anzen and Santen Juichi, 311 and safety, um, and it yielded 525 million hits. That's what people were talking about, all right? This is all I'm just saying. It's a rough, a rough um, indicator. Now, there are a lot of ways to characterize risk and vulnerability in, in Japanese, of course, you know, like risk. Um, but the one that dominated, I think, the national discourse was a word that can't be translated directly. Um, it's more oblique. Uh, it can't be translated directly as risk or vulnerability. It's solteigai, unimaginable. It was unimaginable. Um, because, it, and, and it, it, it was important in this, in, this, in, in this context because the greatest threats to people, it seemed, were uh, from um, events that are unanticipated. And so it's use, solteigai, uh, unimaginable, its use by the government, by TEPCO, as an explanation for their failure to prepare the national population for a 311 scale disaster um, evoked both uh, risk and vulnerability and, and did dominate the national discourse. And some use Soltegai as a masking, a standard rhetorical device, a masking of their own um, responsibility, basically masking performance failure. That's just the way it works in, in rhetoric. Um, that I call in the book the Soltegai defense. Uh, TEPCO was all over that one. And it mattered. It mattered that it was unimaginable because if it was an act of nature, um, they, were, they had uh, less culpability than if it was an act of man. And so it was important to say that this was beyond imagination. Uh, of course, we know now that it wasn't beyond imagination at all. Um, but TEPCO, therefore, because people came to understand that, became the consensus villain in the narrative that grew up around the unimaginable. Um, it, it was an easy target, given its history of falsifying safety reports and covering up violations, withholding information from the public. Um, you know, why the people wondered was so much risk left unplanned for. Why was so much unimagined? Now, the interesting thing, it seems to me, was that, that you know, it wasn't only TEPCO, um, but for, for, with whom, who used the term Soltegai. Soltegai was used to describe the self-defense forces which was, was a really extraordinary thing, not because they had failed, but because they had succeeded so well. And so you began seeing headlines and magazine articles that said things like, it's unimaginable that there's nothing that the self-defense forces of Japan can't be prepared for. They're prepared for anything. And, so, and, and they, were, they were lauded for their exceptional uh, courage and, and success in their humanitarian disaster relief and humanitarian assistance activity. So when it comes to the military, the headline said, there is no word for unimaginable in their, 
in their life. It's very interesting. Now, we heard earlier uh, today about this. We, in fact, I think, Tessa, you showed this. Where are you? Where is Tessa? There, yeah, I think you had this photo, didn't you? This is the, the shitomoji, the, the, the single character that characterized, this is a Japanese word now, zeitgeist, uh, for the year of 2011. That was a joke. Um, uh, in Kyoto, zeitgeist is not a Japanese word. <laughs> okay. Um, the, the point is, it is the representative, and I was really, t really taken with the, com the comparison to Minamata, uh, that a similar kind of a term um, was used. But social solidarity is, of course, not a new tile in the mosaic of, of Japanese national identity. And the people of Tohoku were, were repeatedly applauded for their selflessness, for their resolve, admired almost to the point of essentialist caricature. Uh, for their patient and persevering nature and for their acceptance of what had befallen them and so forth. And so the strong fabric of, of the community, uh, you had terms like machi zukuri, koiki zukuri, kuni zukuri, all of the, everything was being zukurid. Um, there, was, there was community, tsunagu, we heard that term earlier th this morning as well, kizuna, bonds, and so forth, all of this. In the report of the Reconstruction Design Council, the first major government report to be issued after the catastrophe, um, there were 83 references to social solidarity using one of those several words. Um, 83 references in 39 pages. And almost everyone was either in italics or underlined or in quotes or in bold. And if they were able to issue that report with embossed paper, it would have been embossed. This was a major, a major trope. Okay. Let's go to the one I want to spend a little bit more time on. This is about change. Everyone was talking about change. Everyone, myself included, um, were, were convinced that this was the moment. I mean, if you're a social scientist, you're trained in, in contemporary social science, you're trained to believe in punctuated equilibria. You're, you're trained to believe you have a stability and something happens. Something, a war happens, a catastrophe happens, and it shakes up the institutions such that they can be reformulated, reused, re repurposed, if you like. So a new chapter would begin. The, the post-war would be over, uh, and the post-catastrophe would be the new age um, that people would be talking about. Windows of opportunity, new generations, you, you get the point, um, and so forth. And as I said in my remarks earlier, basically this came down to three models, three ways of thinking about change. I won't, I won't reprise this. Um, um, except to, uh, well, I won't reprise this. There were those who said, put it in gear, those who said, stay the course, and those who said, reverse course. And what I did in the book was to uh, look at that in the sectors that I, knew, that I knew best. That is, these are each areas that I've written books about. So I had done a book on security, a book on energy, and a book no one remembers, which was my doctoral dissertation that was my first book. Uh, on local government. Llewellyn, do you remember? Did, you ever, did I ever make you read this? I never made you read this. Okay. Not the local government book. You weren't born at that when I wrote that one. Um, but given, let me, given limited time, let me just flick at two of these, two of these sectors, because what happens is, um, if, you know, the, the way this works is you've got three models and you've got three sectors, you've got nine narratives, and I'm not going to do that to you. So um, I'm not going to do, I'm not going to fill in every box. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, um, let's look at security. Um, for Acceler, to the, the people who said, you know, get it in gear, put it in gear, they looked at this event and they said the lesson of this event is that this was a wake-up call. The next time the, the Japanese self-defense forces are called upon to do the important work that they did, they're not going to be able to call home uh, and say, I'll be, I'll be home for dinner, honey, um, because people will be shooting at them. They won't be you know, they're, are they ready for that? This is a wake-up call. They've got to, we've got to have better equipment, better lift, be able to get equipment, get, get um, uh, materiel um, out to them in the field when they're under pressure in a war. And so it's a wake-up call. There were those, those who said, just, you know, stay the course. For them, 311, 311 on the sustained side um, was a proof of concept. They said, we have been saying for 50 years or more that the self-defense forces need to be considered a legitimate element, a legitimate arm of Japanese government, and the alliance with the United States is really critical in, in its performance and in our national security. And so we told you so. That's, that's their narrative, proof of concept. Um, so just let's just do it. Let's just keep doing what we're doing. Maybe we can do more, but we don't have to change everything. And then this was the interesting one. The folks 
who were saying, you know, let's go back to the future, they had, a, they had a different idea. Their idea was to go back to the true meaning, the original intention of Article 9 of the Constitution. That is to re-tether um, themselves to, to Article 9 and say, they, they acknowledge that the self-defense forces did a brilliant job in humanitarian assistance and disaster relief after 311. They did a brilliant job, and the Americans did a terrific job. They don't focus much on that one, but uh, there were you know, 20,000 US troops in Operation Tomodachi, which, uh, you know, it's interesting. This is the first time the term Operation Tomodachi has been uttered. We've been talking about 311 for a long time. I gotta report that back in Washington. <laughs> um, but the point is, for them, the lesson of 311 is these guys did a great job because they didn't have guns in their hands, they had shovels. So the lesson is we should have a global humanitarian assistance and disaster relief force. That's what Article 9 um, is for. That's what we should be doing and we shouldn't be carrying guns or thinking about war and so forth. So their narrative is a disarmament narrative. Um, in energy, I'll just quickly flick at this and then really we'll sit down, but in energy, the nuclear village narrative was the one that I think most people paid attention to. This is a, a story that was spun uh, from people who said, let's get the hell out of nuclear energy. Let's get out of, even out of fossil fuels. Let's move on to renewables. Um, we're, talking about, we're, we're talking about really making big changes in the way in which energy is delivered um, and, and, and generated and delivered uh, in Japan. So for them, it was all about using the collusive behavior of the regulators who didn't regulate and the regulated who weren't regulated um, and their collusion, their, you know, the, the, everything from Amakudari on down, no pun intended. Um, uh, the, whole nuclear, the whole nuclear village uh, narrative got a lot of traction um, in Japan from the folks who wanted to get out of and into uh, renewables. The folks who said sustain, as I said earlier in my remarks, it was all about the black swan. They said, look, we, we can't do without nuclear. We will, we will just, we can't. We have to have a base load, a stable base load. We can't do it without nuclear. We can have safer nuclear plants. We can, we can re-regulate them. We can get the regulators out of the, you know, separate the regulators from the, the, the uh, pr promoters, that is, get it out of METI. They did. Um, but, but let's stay the course because we need nuclear nuclear energy, uh, and after all, this is a once in a millennium black swan. And those who said, let's just go back to simpler times. Um, that is, this whole, the whole story is a story um, about, um, uh, about um, how globalization and modernization has destroyed Japan, and if we would just go back to a time when countryside and city were in better balance with one another, all would be okay. Um, that's, it's different from these guys because whoops uh, from 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 these guys because these guys are pro growth, these guys are not, okay. But it's it, it's a it's a very different so it's a very different kind of narrative. All right, finally, the way I I I, um, I, I, I come out is is with a pair of epigraphs that frame what I thought were the mixed lessons. Remember, I was writing from a very close perspective on this. I was finishing this manuscript in June July of 2012. We saw the, the demonstrations at that time, so I was watching those demonstrations while I was finishing this. And it seemed to me that there were, there were two basic paths that Japan's politics would head in, and that it was really too early to know which one it would be. And they were framed by these two quotes, um, one by a civic activist who said, look, there are no villains in the story, only a dysfunctional system, and for him, um, uh, he actually chaired the first independent diet investigation ever. Um, his hearings were open, they were televised, they were translated into English uh, in real time so that the world would see um, what the Japanese were talking about when they, and trying to fix because he was worried that if it was only done um, uh, in camera and in Japanese um, it would be covered up. So his, his approach was for transparency and said look it, we, we have opportunity here for structural change uh, that extends far beyond this commission, um, that there's a move to 311 stimulated toward more open debate uh, in Japan, more transparent decision making and suggested the possibility for a very robustly democratic Japan. This quote, more troubling, right? You read it and you go, wow. Well, I asked 
this was a diet member, and, and I asked him three times to repeat himself uh, because I, I really was surprised at, at hearing this. Um, his observation, on, you know, in contrast, aligns with a different, I thought, fairly insistent finding um, of, of the research, which is that much of the crisis rhetoric um, might amount to little more than empty and self-serving chatter. Um, he, he voiced a, really a, a rather unpleasant truth um, about crises in general, is that even citizens who are moved to help neighbors in distress um, find it difficult to sustain their empathy for really long periods of time because they have their own discontents. They have their own problems. So I, after I thought about this a bit and talked to my neighbors and others, I took it as a less cynical, I took it less cynically than I initially did and more as a comment on the credulity of analysts like myself and on the manipulative efforts by policy entrepreneurs, which I've already described, who plant false hopes for change. Um, on this account, the rhetoric of crisis should be dialed back uh, uh, to a more realistic level, one that focuses on regaining what was lost rather than on creating what ultimately can't be. It suggests, in a way, that resilience uh, is the best um, that the 311 victims can expect from themselves, and that indulgence uh, may be the most they can really realistically expect from others. So it, it, it ends by saying, I end by saying that the master narrative is still under construction. Uh, the blame game is very much still underway. So you get, you get this. Now, um, before anyone leaves this room and believes that I think this is peculiarly Japanese, I want to share this. <laughs> uh, and this. <laughs> and finally, this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Samuels. A somewhat more uplifting presentation than Aurelius. Um, we have about 10 minutes uh, for questions, so I might take a few questions at a time and then get the panelists to, to respond. Um, so first at the back there, Chris. Down here and then Murray. Uh, Christopher Beccaria from Waseda University. Um, Professor Samuels, I, I admired your passion immediately after 311 being a, uh, a lightning rod for thinking about change in Japan and everything. Um, but let me be blunt, a little bit critical. Um, myself and I think many other people in Japan were really quite taken aback by a lot of Japanese stutters, study scholars, what? Um, academic entrepreneurialism in response to 311, the proliferation of publications, proposals, um, and numerous um, organizational efforts, uh, which was really about kind of your disaster, my, my opportunity in many respects, to sound a little bit cynical. Um, and that's particularly strange coming from Japan specialists because if there's, there's one common thing in history about Japan, of course, is that Japan's had myriad disasters and very few of them have been transformative. The architects, for example, have told us a lot about the, the myriad missed opportunities when you've had, for example, Tokyo burnt to, burnt to ruins. So, so what does it tell us about our scholarly endeavors in relation to Japan? That there was an, an, an irony that perhaps we didn't bring a balanced sense of a scale of disaster to our interpretation of 311. Can, I might take a, a couple more, yeah, if that's all right, down here. Thank you. Kensuke uh, Yoshida, political minister of Japanese embassy. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, all the panelists for their presentation, excellent presentations. I found them all uh, educating, insightful, and uh, informative. Uh, I have uh, uh, one comment and one question. Uh, my comment goes to the very title of this panel, Japan's Political Risks. My immediate reaction is, is there any? Um, I don't think it's in everybody's mind that Japan's politics facing uh, risks, uh, although we are aware that uh, we have uh, a whole bunch of, uh, a whole platoon of uh, challenges, political, uh, economic, and social. Uh, but not just Abe government is robust. Uh, in Japan, uh, we have uh, successfully uh, practiced parliamentary democracies for more than seven decades. So uh, risks uh, is a, a little bit too alarming a word. So uh, I just wonder if uh, uh, Shiro-san might want to consider a revision of the time. 
And the question uh, goes to uh, my friend Akiyama Sensei. Uh, I was impressed by uh, your uh, uh, presentation, especially when you say uh, we are facing a strategic insolvency. Uh, as a person who has been in the foreign service for uh, nearly three decades, uh, probably I am uh, more than anybody else acutely aware of Japan's foreign service is uh, uh, understaffed and underfunded, but we cannot complain forever about this dire situation. So uh, I wonder if uh, Kiyama Sensei could enlighten us with your brilliant ideas. What could be possible way out of this strategic insolvency? Thank you. Mari? I was intrigued by Professor Mulgan's uh, uh, less than half glass empty approach to politics in Japan and uh, it's very um, uh, understandable in many cases if, if somebody's been involved with it for a very long time that that is the way. However, I wanted to specifically address the point which I know you're a specialist in and that is the agricultural politics of Japan. In the seven years that I was there um, and subsequently I think one saw a, a, a gradual whittling away of the power of the agricultural lobby, albeit that it's still very strong and it's still kicking. Um, it's certainly less uh, uh, strong, I think, uh, now than it uh, has been for a long time. Um, the, cr the critical point is that while, it's, uh, while change is happening in the agricultural sector, where there's increased tendency towards corporatisation and uh, a more efficient farming practices to increase productivity and that sort of thing. Um, is it going to be the death knell of Japan's uh, ability to sign on to any meaningful TPP or will Abe and others bite the bullet and at least go really part of the way to um, uh, significantly reducing tariffs beyond those that they reduced in the Australia-Japan Free Trade Agreement. And um, we have two additional questions. We might get the panelists to respond first and then open up to another round, so. Shall I start with Christopher? Yes, please. Question. Okay, so um, that's an interesting question. Um, <laughs> I haven't been, uh, uh, been called an academic entrepreneur before, um, <laughs> especially in my, selection of, uh, in my selection of research topics. Um, I, I, let me start from, from, from a point that you, that you made, which I think is exactly right. Um, that is, there have been very few transformative um, crises, um, although the Pacific War certainly was one. Um, I think 1923 and Tokyo certainly was one. Uh, you come, the, the Japanese military comes, and this is something that Tessa alluded to earlier today, the Japanese military comes out the other end of, of that, uh, that event with uh, significantly greater power, after 1925 certainly, significantly greater power than it had ever had before, than it had had before. Um, and um, it mattered. I think 1923 and that, that crisis mattered a lot <coughs> for the balance of power inside Japanese domestic politics. Um, I, you know, you identify as cynical, um, I think it's, it was the opposite for most of the people who rushed in to try to understand what had happened. I think, as I said in my remarks, uh, we, were all, we all cut our teeth on ideas that, 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 that moments of real perturbations to a system um, uh, deserve our attention uh, and that it's our responsibility to figure out what will be left when things settle into the new equilibrium. From a social science perspective, it's sort of an imperative. It's what we, it's what we do as social scientists, number one. Um, second, just from, from a Japanese perspective, the Japanese deeply cared about how to understand what had happened. That's what the national conversation was about. Um, the world cared about what had happened and what to make of it. And so uh, it just seems to me that there's no reason to, to, uh, uh, to be cynical about uh, why academics who have presumably, notionally, the tools to do the analysis wouldn't rush in to do the analysis. And I think that's what was motivating my colleagues, and certainly that was what was motivating me. I, on, on March 10th, I, I had a, basically 80% of a manuscript ready to go on political captivity 
um, and, and I just, I dropped it, and, and although Llewellyn has been trying to get me to go back to it uh, for, for three years, I, I'm not sure I will. That's a book that won't get written because I thought this was just so important. Okay, I'm saying. Thank you, Yoshida san. Um, uh, you know, in Japan, we, uh, uh, the one of the imminent issue is so-called black company. That's uh, the company which forced the laborers to uh, make up, you know, of uh, volunteer extra hour works uh, for free of charge. And I think foreign ministry is one of them. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not going to blame uh, my colleagues in the foreign ministry, and I don't, I don't want to say work hard more. But um, more, it's my concern about this political insolvency, uh, the strategic insolvency, which is about the, the, the gap between the expectations and what the Japan can deliver. And uh, if uh, you know, Japan, Japan keep on committing more and more, then we are not able, Japan is not able to deliver what they have promised. So that kind of uh, uh, gap or sort of insolvency probably cause uh, the distrust on the Japan or Japanese government. So the thing is, two things, maybe the government can do some expectation controls or reframing the, what they have promised as uh, what actual Japanese government is doing. That means, you know, I think Japan, does not need to pay for everything. For example, in uh, the cooperation uh, with the international community to uh, promote the women's right or minorities' right, uh, you know, I actually was suggesting my colleagues that maybe Japan should establish a fund under the UN framework to support activities to help the women under the, in the conflict or something. But you know, probably Jap you know, in case of a Human Security Fund, which was a pre a pre uh, in a precedent example, you know, Japan paid everything, but uh, lacked the international cooperation. <coughs> but maybe this time, Japan try take initiative in creating some sort of uh, international initiative and put some uh, seed money, but collect money from others as well. So that's probably the way how we utilize the limited resources and the sort of uh, put the leverage on the, uh, the idea into this international community. And the other thing is, um, since Mr. Ha Abe has uh, made a commitment, in particular with the partners such as Australia, United States, and other uh, you know, security partners, I think maybe that's the, the message that political, uh, the political message is carried uh, through this uh, strengthening framework is a very important uh, uh, reassurance to the, the countries in the region for a contribution to the security. So I think this, uh, you know, Japan should commit more to the dialogue. And dialogue is relatively free compared to the, the spending money on the, uh, you know, assistance and so forth. So uh, I think the co political commitment is something that I would like to emphasize as a solution. Thank you. Really? Yes. Uh, Murray, to deal with the first part of your question first, uh, <clears throat> is agriculture going to be the death knell? Or is Japanese agriculture going to be the death knell uh, to the TPP. Uh, well, my, my answer to this question is that's up to the United States as much as it is to Japan. Um, Japan's TPP policy is, or stance or strategy is to act cautiously and wait for the United States to show flexibility. And there's quite a difference between Japan now on TPP and say Japan 20 years ago in the final stages of the Uruguay round uh, agricultural agreement. Uh, Japan is not afraid now of being blamed or isolated and blamed for the failure of the TPP. Uh, it will share the blame with the United States. Everyone is waiting for them to do a deal, uh, both of them. Uh, so it's not solely up to Japan. I've been able to answer. The second part, um, will Japan go beyond what it did in relation to Australia? Well, in my view, Japan was very much hoping that J JPA, uh, the Japan-Australia EPA, would act as the model for its agreement with the United States. And as we know, the United States is not prepared to accept this. It wants more. But, um, you know, Abe wants the TPP, but he's not prepared to open the agricultural market to get it. And uh, he here he has history on his side. No trade agreement that Japan has ever signed has ever opened its agricultural market. It has an, exclu an agricultural exclusions-based trade strategy. 
So there are exclusions uh, with very high levels of tariffs and other arrangements for a very, very small number of agricultural, so-called sensitive agricultural products. So it's a question of can they come to a landing zone or this favourite phrase that they tend to use, or a landing place, for and get an agreement in terms of what level of tariffs, what level of tariffs will they end up on, with on beef and pork at, at um, at what point will the safeguards kick in and will the United States accept special deals on rice? For example, there could be the creation of a 400,000 ton rice quota on top of the existing one, um, which can, and that demand could be steered largely towards the United States rice growers um, as a kind of a sweetener in the deal. So, and what to do about cars too. There could be some, some sort of bilateralism uh, evident here and, and, and that's to be expected because you know the TPP is turning out to be a series of bilateral deals. So um, you know um, I, I, I think that uh, Japan is going to stick to its guns on the TPP and it's a question of both showing flexibility but whether they can come together at a mutually agreed point is anyone's guess. I wouldn't like to put any money, money on it. <laughs> Look, I know we're running out of time, but I did cut two questioners off before we open uh, to the panel. So I'll get Llewellyn and then Manuel to ask quick questions, sure. make quick comments, and then get quick responses from the, the panel. Okay, thanks for the terrific panel. Llewellyn Hughes uh, from the uh, Crawford School uh, here at the NU. Um, I have a question for both uh, Professor Samuels and Professor Mulgan um, about the role of the public uh, as restraining, uh, a restraining force in Japanese politics, and particularly in relation to security policy. And the reason I ask is because I have slightly different or quite different views of the role of the public in, 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 in Japanese policy making from the two of you. Uh, Professor Sanders in your keynote alluded to the role of Japanese citizens uh, slash voters uh, moderating the Abe administration's attempt to change the equilibrium in, in relation to collective defense. Uh, and that was a very different uh, view to the view that I heard uh, Professor Mulgan uh, offer on the role of citizens slash voters in Japanese politics as primarily organized through kind of collective organizations associated with individual politicians. So I want to ask uh, how you see the role of the public uh, in relation to security policy, uh, particularly as a restraining uh, its role as a restraint on uh, in collective defense and intelligence matters in relation to the kinds of changes in this other. Thank you. That's, that's pretty close to the same question I had. So I'll just add a little something into the mix, which is that more than 60% of Japanese voters are completely unaligned to any political party. And how does that add to the conversation? Excellent. The same question and brief. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with him. <laughs> I was talking about an organised interest group, and I'm not sure uh, there are organised interest groups on defence. Um, that you're talking about the broad public here, rather than an organised interest group. And I've had to make that distinction myself uh, in, in another, something else I've been doing lately, where there are a lot of citizens um, movements against the TPP, but I was restricted to talking just about interest groups on the TPP. So that's really all I have to say on that. Um, now, as for unaligned voters, I don't think it's 60%. Um, on the latest NHK poll, it's somewhere around 35 to 37%. So it's much, 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 in terms of people expressing a view that they are not supporting any political party. So that's how you want to define it. Um, well, my answer is I agree with her. <laughs> um, almost. I, a couple of things. Uh, to Llewellyn's question, to Llewellyn's part of the, of the question, I am really struck um, repeatedly by how important public opinion is in, in, in areas where you know the political leadership is determined to do something. And yet, it, it has got to, as you, you, the term you used, is, I think, is exactly the right term, to moderate. Um, it, it's, um, uh, its expectations and its, its prescriptions. And it did it in collective defense, it did it in, in intelligence, in, in the state secrets law, but it's, it's done it more broadly. A. B. On the other hand, 
there has been a rise in public acceptance and embrace of um, the security of Japan's institutions for national security, particularly its military. Um, there wasn't really a debate about whether or not Japan should have a secrecy law. That's a huge change. That's, that's public opinion, and I think it, 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 it's, it's changed over time. On um, this issue of, of how many are not aligned, I'm, the number I saw, I was shaking my head. You said 60%, I was shaking my head, but the thought bubble above it was, I don't think it's that high, but it's not as low as I think, or really, I mean, that's a range. The, the number that I've most recently seen was 48%. People, you know, and I don't know if it was NHK, but it was, it was a, a public opinion poll that asked, what party do you support? And the people who said, no party, was at 48%. That's huge. And that, those are the people I was talking about who can be swayed, uh, who are, have, as I said in my keynote, have ears. They are listening to the debate. They're making judgments. Um, they can be swayed. And so it's up to the political entrepreneurs to move them. But unless they do, um, the political entrepreneurs are not going to get all that they wish. That's democracy. That, to me, is very reassuring. Well, please join me in thanking the panel for an excellent discussion.